Sleepy Bulldog Productions presents Mrs. Walker. Hi, um, I'm going to go through a whole bunch of the names and terms for this unit because I think that's what you need to focus on when you study. Um, and yes, I am actually at home. And that was my dog. All right, so we're going to start with the areas. Okay, this is the first section, first section we looked at in this unit. Now remember that after the Harappan civilization disappears, um, people are living in villages, they abandon the big cities, and this is when the Aryans come in. Um, they migrate into the Indian subcontinent from somewhere in Europe, most likely through the Khyber Pass, through the Hindu Kush Mountains, and they substantially, fundamentally change Indian culture. Okay? One of the things that the Aryans contribute to India are the Vedas. The Vedas are considered fundamental religious text for Hinduism. Um, they contain hymns, and it basically outlines the fundamental beliefs. There are four Vedas. Another important religious work are the Upanishads. The Upanishads are a collection of essays that interpret the Vedic hymns, or in other words, they're telling people about the Vedas. Okay, so the Vedas and the Upanishads are both considered fundamental religious books, and you need to remember those titles. Now, when the Aryans come in, they basically impose the caste system on the Dasas, the people who are already living in India. The caste system is the system of Indian social classes, and this is going to persist for a few thousand years in India. The Indians did not call it the caste system, but that's the term that we know it by today. The term was given to it by a European. Okay. So, in the caste system, the castes are the individual social classes. As originally set up, the castes were based on occupation, it is a social pyramid, meaning that you have fewer people in the upper classes and a lot more people at the bottom. And because the Aryans are the ones setting this up, they are going to be the ones in the topmost positions in society. The uppermost caste would be the Brahmins, and they were originally the priest caste. The second caste are the Kshatriyas, and they are the warrior caste, upper class people. Next, we have the Vaishyas. They are the traders, the merchants. Um, I like to think of them as kind of the business class because that's where a lot of those jobs end up falling in terms of the social ladder. And then the fourth caste would be the Shudras, and they are the peasants and laborers. Now, once we get down to the Shudras, we're talking about people who are more the, the native people in India, the Dasas. Also, because the Aryans are taller and lighter skinned, we do get some racial elements that become very much present in the caste system. Over time, it's not so much determined by job, but you are born into a caste and you're pretty much stuck there for your entire life. There is no mobility between the social classes. The people who are so low in ancient India that they are not even really considered part of the caste system would be the untouchables. These are the people who end up doing all of the dirty jobs, ditch diggers and grave diggers and butchers and trash collectors, you know, all of those jobs that basically nobody else wants to do. Other aspects of Indian culture connecting the history and the religion, okay? The Mahabharata is a very significant work. It's extremely long. And the major part of the Mahabharata goes through a lot of the conflicts that the early dynastic families in India have with trying to control the country. One section of the Mahabharata is the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, the Bhagavad Gita is essentially a series of conversations between the hero, whose name is Arjuna, and Krishna, who is his charioteer. 
Um, Arjuna has to go in to fight a battle. The next day he's worried because it's basically a different branch of his family that he's fighting. Is this the right thing? Should he go through with it? And Krishna basically tells him to do his duty. And Arjuna ends up winning. Um, and if you look at the Bhagavad Gita, it's a very nice expression of all the basics of Hinduism that we've, we've been dealing with this year. It was also for Gandhi a big inspiration when he was in prison. All right, another book that is important. This one is uh, much more focused on mythology than on the, the uh, specifics of Hinduism. The Ramayana deals with Rama, who is one of those aspects of Vishnu who comes to earth. Um, he fights the evil demon, demon king, Ravana, and he has to try to save his wife, Sita, who has been kidnapped. And it involves a monkey king, and it's, it's really kind of awesome. If you ever it's a very good story. It is a very entertaining story. And it's got a monkey in it. It does have monkeys. Okay. Actually, it's got a lot of monkeys in it. A lot of monkeys. And let's face it. That's a positive. Monkeys are cool. Okay. They're not as cool as robots. Okay, you, you can stop now. Of course, robot monkeys. You can stop. Yeah, now. go ahead. I'm going to hurt you. All right. Looking at some of the specific terms for Hinduism, one of the goals, or actually the, the ultimate goal for Hinduism is to achieve moksha. Moksha is the Hindu term for enlightenment. And what happens when a person achieves enlightenment is that they no longer have to suffer through the cycle of birth and, and rebirth and suffering that happens to people on earth. Now to achieve moksha, someone would have to have an understanding of how the universe works. The relationship between the Atman, which is the individual soul, every person on the earth has an Atman, or like a piece of divinity within them. And the Brahman, which is the world soul, um, the term that I usually think of with this is one that's been used by American writers in the past. They called it an oversoul, which is like the world soul that contains all the other souls, if you want to think of it that way. Now, in order to achieve enlightenment, a person really has to be kind of working for it. Um, for most people, they will not achieve enlightenment in their current lifetime. According to Hinduism, you're really not even close, anywhere close to it if you're not in those upper three castes. But to get closer to enlightenment, reincarnation helps with that process. Reincarnation is the process of being reborn after a person dies. And if, for a Hindu, you maintain good karma through several lifetimes, karma being the sum total of all the good and bad things that you do, if you have good karma, and you fulfill your dharma, dharma is all of the obligations that you have as a person who is alive, um, this would be different for people at different stages in their life cycle. Dharma for a kid is different from Dharma for an adult, for example. People have different responsibilities at different points in their lives. But if you have good karma, you follow your Dharma, you can be reborn into a better position and hopefully into a higher caste. A few other aspects of Hinduism. The Hindu Trimurti, or the Hindu Trinity, would be those three important aspects of God that we've talked about in class. Brahma, the creator. Brahma has four faces, and there are four Vedas. So I always remember that. Vishnu, the preserver. And we talked about the avatars of Vishnu that he sends to earth or he takes on different forms to come to earth to solve problems. For example, Rama was one of his avatars. And Shiva, the destroyer. And Shiva, one of his forms is the cosmic dancer. You see him in dance postures and statues. And it is said that if he ever stops dancing, the world will end. And that would be bad. Okay. Some other things that are important to Hinduism real quick. The Ganges River is very sacred to Hindus. It was formed when Vishnu's toes melted, and when it fell to earth, it landed on Shiva's hair. Also, 
They do not eat cows. Okay? Cows are sacred because they give people a lot of different resources. Um, butter, buttermilk, yogurt, um, very important cheese in the Indian diet. They can use the hide from the cow, the leather after the cow dies. They don't eat cows. One religion that splits off from Hinduism is Jainism. Okay? Um, the hallmark of Jainism is a very strong belief, a guiding belief in nonviolence, and the name of their extreme nonviolence is Ahimsa. This is, again, their guiding principle. It's a major thing they believe. Everything living has a soul and should not be harmed. 